Have we witnessed the best of humanity already? Were our forebearers, ancient philosophers and religious leaders more clever than we are today? Or cleverer than we will ever be? Have we reached the peak of our evolution? Will genetic engineering give us the opportunity to create our own super species? Charles Darwin's proposition hinges on not just the theory of evolution, but a credible mechanism stating that evolution occurs via a means of natural selection. The idea of natural selection requires an appropriate mechanism of inheritance that ensures that species give birth to their kind and also provide a variation so they are not completely identical. Gregor Mendel offered a more fitting explication, showing that inheritance works by transmitting units of information now referred to as genes. Genes contain the distinguishing features of the parents, which are recombined in the children via the machinations of sex and also liable to change, known as mutation. Darwin was oblivious of Mendel's research, but their ideas were merged together by 20th century biologists to form Neo-Darwinism in the 1940s. According to these Neo-Darwinists, natural selection takes out individuals who have less beneficial genes and favors those with beneficial ones. As a result, the unbeneficial genes tend to be lost with time, while the fittest spread through the gene pool. The Neo-Darwin model has been altered over time, but it still retains its general idea. There is no destiny in evolution, whether Darwin or Neo-Darwin. The idea of natural selection focuses on the present and not the distant future. Remains of our forebears have shown us that they increased over the past five million years from about a meter to nearly two while our brains have increased from an apish 400 milliliters, or thereabouts, to 1400 milliliters. There is nothing in natural selection indicating that our forebears did more than adapt to whatever their surroundings brought their way, or to suggest that we will grow more godlike with time. Before Darwin, the Frenchman Jean-Baptiste Lamarck came up with a different mechanism of evolution via inheritance of acquired characteristics. His observations were drawn out of the body's adaptation through whatever is demanded of it. He suggested that this mechanism explains why blacksmiths possess bigger muscles. However, he was wrong to propose that a blacksmith passes on biceps acquired via hard labor to their offspring. Similarly, great thinking won't increase the size of the brain. Evolution is not determined by destiny or our conscious doings, but neo-Darwinism, mutation, and natural selection are all there is to evolution. In humans, the neo-Darwinism mechanism appears impeded as some genetic variants are being lost and some tribal groups continue to become extinct. There is an unsteadiness to it, seeing that AIDS are making progress in Africa while Kenyans are currently copulating faster than Italians. So any genetic variants that are peculiar to either group must be rising or falling. Record-breaking scientists and professional athletes are praised, but they do not have more children than the ordinary man. Infant death rates are still on the rise in some societies, but in genetic terms, it hit randomly because the poor are not genetically different. The fact is that genetic impediments happen, which is obvious from the mineral remains of our ancestors. Some lineage of clams still remain in the original state for tens or even hundreds of millions of years. The present-day leopards and impala are brisker than their ancestors of 50 million years ago, but they have not altered a bit. An explanation could be proffered to break the deadlock. As a result of war or other natural disasters, humans could be isolated into island groups and natural selection could have worked separately on them, thereby creating a species of neo-humans, each with distinct adaptabilities. Another explanation is that humans engineered their own genetic future through the same technique that made wheat from wild grasses 
and Aberdeen Angus from Oryx, which could have transformed humanity to what we now see. Eugenics, which is the intentional transformation of the human gene pool, was a common practice across most parts of Europe and in the US. The interests of the eugenicists was in forestalling the decline of their species. Hitler brought the political dangers of eugenics to bear when he annihilated the people who didn't meet the criteria of his super species. Even though eugenics have become obsolete and forbidden, the new biotechnologies seem to open the window to novel possibilities like cloning, genomics, and genetic engineering. Genetic engineering is the ultimate one, and it involves the transfer of particular stretches of DNA from one individual to another. It is already gaining ground as the first phase of the Human Genome Project was completed last year. It is beginning to show which pieces of DNA shares similarities with particular genes and which pieces are worth transferring. Genetic engineering is already a routine in bacteria, increasingly in genetically modified food crops and lab mice. It's only a matter of time before it becomes applicable to humans. Doctors have been trying to repair affected tissues in people, like the correction of damaged genes in the lungs of cystic fibrosis patients. This won't have any effect on the eggs and sperms and would not be passed on to future generations. A more radical approach would be to repair the cystic fibrosis gene in a very young embryo, so the gene would be passed on. But some already speak not of repairing what is damaged, but improving on what already works. Even with all the fuss over genetic engineering, the impact on evolution will be very little. The genetic repair of damaged embryos would affect a few families in the future, but the impact will be less significant since a person may carry the CF gene and yet half of his or her sperm or eggs will be devoid of it. An easier method would be to use super ovulation by fertilizing the eggs in vitro to produce a batch of embryos and then select the ones that lack the mutant gene. The thing is, most of the genes causing single gene disorders, including CF, have adverse effects unless they are passed on from both parents. Most bad genes are very uncommon, but a few are not. The gene that causes sickle cell anemia occurs frequently in people of African descent, while a surprisingly 1 in 20 Caucasian carries the CF mutant. Based on the assumption of biologists on random mating, each CF carrier has only a 1 in 20 chance of mating with another CF carrier. So, only 1 in 400 Caucasian marriages will bring the carriers together, and only 1 in 4 of their offspring will inherit the bad gene from both parents. Summarily, only 1,600 children in a Caucasian population will actually manifest the disease. It is estimated that every one of us is liable to carry an average of five damaged genes that would cause disease if we had children by some similar carrier. Eliminating all bad genes would be a Herculean task because you would have to kill the entire human species. The idea of a genetically modified baby is spread not by the press, but by scientists who have their eyes on huge sums of money and push the hoax belief that what people are prepared to pay for is good. The listing of genes via the Human Genome Project does not open the book of life as claimed by many idle scientists in contradiction with the original Cambridge scientists behind the research. Based on current knowledge or even with future knowledge, it would mean going beyond what is right by trying to improve on the gene of a healthy human baby. In conclusion, Humans seem probable to remain unchanged genetically. The idea of man evolving may have been an accident or providence. Whichever it was, we will be doing a terrible job trying to make humans better than they already are. Natural selection is a far more reasonable approach than human invention. What a piece of work is a man, said Hamlet. How beauteous mankind is, said Miranda. Both of them were absolutely right.